Good evening, aspirants. I have an important announcement to make. 2023 prelims is fast approaching. There is only 5 more months. If you are serious about boosting your prelim score, make use of the pre storming by Shankar A.S. Academy. The next batch of pre storming is starting today. The registration link for pre storming is provided in the description below. Now, let us get back into the Indonesian lessons by Shankar A.S. Academy for the date 14th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Now, without wasting time, let us get into the discussion. Look at this editorial article. This editorial article talks about the gradually moderating inflation rates in the economy. We all know how the pandemic affected the global economy as a whole and obviously India is not an exception, right? We saw price hikes during the pandemic. The author here talks about how the prices are again moderating to a normal level. Further, to get a deeper understanding of this news article, we will start by understanding what inflation is all about. In simple terms, inflation is nothing but the raise in prices of most goods and services that we use daily. It is basically the average price rise of a basket of commodities. Here you should know the opposite of this phenomenon, which is deflation. During deflation, the price starts decreasing. Okay, This is the basic about inflation and deflation. In India, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation measures inflation. We also practice something called as inflation targeting, which is done by the RBI. This simply means RBI is tasked with the role of keeping inflation rates in check. The central government usually notifies the target and it is currently set at 4% consumer price index inflation. The upper tolerance limit is at 6% and the lower tolerance limit is at 2%. Note that RBI targets CPI and not Wholesale Price Index or WPI. The WPI is the general change in price level at the wholesale market. And CPI is the change in price level in the goods and services of common use, mostly in the last stage of transaction that is in the retail market. From prelims perspective, we should know the difference between CPI and WPI. And another concept that we should learn about is the headline inflation and core inflation. We know that the prices of food and fuel are too volatile. So a small change in price of these two commodities would seriously affect the rate of inflation. Right? The headline inflation is the normal inflation rate that is traditionally targeted by the RBA. From the basket of commodities that are used to calculate this inflation rate, if we take out food and the fuel component, it brings out the core price inflation. In simple terms, core inflation is headline inflation minus food and fuel inflation. The author here mentioned about something called as sticky inflation. Let's learn about that as well. Sticky inflation is a condition where there is a combination of stubbornly high inflation and often stagnant growth. Normally, what does the RBI do when the inflation in the economy is increasing? It will increase the policy rates, right? This move normally will suck out the excess money supply in the economy. When the money supply decreases, then the demand will decrease, which will bring down inflation. But you have to note here that this method only brings down demand pull inflation. In some cases, there might be inflation due to cost push factors. In such a case, the increase in policy rate by RBI does not result in decreasing the inflation. This kind of inflation is only called as sticky inflation. Sticky inflation usually occurs not due to increase in demand in the economy, but due to increase in raw material and labor cost. So, basically sticky inflation is cost push inflation that is immune to the inflation control measures of the RBA. So, this is the basic about sticky inflation. Now, coming back to the editorial, at the end of the editorial, the author suggests some measures to ensure that inflation stays in check in the future also. The author suggests that the government must take steps to control inflation along with the RBA. Right now, RBA is controlling inflation by increasing the repo rate. When repo rate keeps on increasing, borrowing becomes costly. This brings down private investment and economic growth of our country. So, in addition to RBA, if the government also through its fiscal policy tries to control inflation, it will have long-term positive impacts in the economy. 
for example currently in the global market crude oil prices have come down but we consumers are still paying the same price for our fuel government must take steps so that the fall in crude oil prices in the global market reflects for our consumers also this move of the government will bring down inflation so basically the author suggests that both the rbi and the government must act hand in hand to control inflation in our economy so that's all regarding this editorial in this discussion we saw the basics about inflation deflation we saw the difference between headline inflation and uh, core inflation we also saw the difference between cpi and wpi then we saw the basics about sticky inflation and finally we saw the steps suggested by the author to control inflation in the long run so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article now look at this article it says that the opposition members were denied the opportunity to seek clarifications regarding the india china standoff so the opposition members reminded the modi government about the 1962 india china war it was said that during the 1962 war parliament discussed the incursions at length even the then prime minister mr jawaharlal nehru he rejected outrightly the idea of holding a secret session at that time and this is about the news article given here in this context let us briefly see about the sino india war of 1962 and we will also understand about what is this secret session first of all let us take the sino india war india got its independence in the year 1947 and the people's republic of china was formed in the year 1949 at that time indian government was maintaining cordial relationship with china The first sign of discord between India and China came in the year 1950. It was when China invaded Tibet. The disagreement is because India supported Tibet and India proposed negotiations. The second issue is with regards to the borders. China started to deploy troops near the border area. India now had to contend China in its northern and eastern borders that is near Akshay Chin region and the Arunachal Pradesh region respectively. After this India entered into the Panchashil agreement with China in the year 1954. This is called as the five principles of peaceful coexistence. This was done in hope to put an end to the Chinese provocation. But what happened on the contrary in the year 1957 China illegally occupied the Akshay Chin region and completed construction of their western highway through it. So to counter continued Chinese aggression India started the policy of establishing series of small post along its northern and eastern borders with China. This is done to prevent further Chinese incursions into India's territory and this is only called as forward policy. But the problem is that most post were not capable of giving a fight and they were logistically unsustainable. So various conflict and military incidents between China and India happened throughout the summer of 1962 on october 20 1962 china's people's liberation army invaded india in ladakh and across the mcmohan line in the arunachal pradesh region so this is the crux about the sino india war of 1962 now coming back to the article in the article i mentioned about a term called secret sitting right now in our discussion we will see about this secret sitting as the name suggest secret sitting means sitting happening in secrecy if the leader of the house makes a request for secret sitting then the speaker will fix a day or part of the sitting of the house in secret now on the side note interested aspirants can post in the comment section who is the leader of the house in lok sabha okay now coming back when the house sits in secret no stranger will be permitted to be present in the chamber lobby or gallery of the parliament but the members of the council that is the rajya sabha may be present in their gallery apart from the members of the rajya sabha persons who are authorized by the speaker may also be present in the chamber lobby or galleries of the city so this is about the term secret sitting so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the basics about sino india war of 1962 in addition to this we saw the details about the term secret sitting So with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article
லுக் அது சாப்பிட ஆர்டிகல் திஸ் ஆர்டிகல் டாக்ஸ் அபவுட் த அர்பன் ரூரல் மேனுஃபேக்சரிங் ஷிஃப்ட் த ஆத்தர் ஆஃப் திஸ் ஆர்டிகல் சேஸ் தட் திஸ் ஷிஃப்ட் ஹேஸ் போத் அட்வான்டேஜஸ் அண்ட் சேலஞ்சஸ் ஸோ இன் திஸ் ஆர்டிகல் டிஸ்கஷன் லெட் அஸ் அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் வாட் இஸ் அர்பன் ரூரல் மேனுஃபேக்சரிங் ஷிஃப்ட் த ரீசன் ஃபார் சச் அ ஷிஃப்ட் அண்ட் த சேலஞ்சஸ் அசோசியேட்டட் வித் இட் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் வாட் இஸ் அர்பன் ரூரல் மேனுஃபேக்சரிங் ஷிஃப்ட் here by this term the author is referring to a trend in india's manufacturing sector where employment and manufacturing activities are moving from large cities to smaller towns and rural areas this phenomenon is evident from the report released a decade ago the report was released by the world bank and its title is is india's manufacturing sector moving away from cities policy research working paper see you can note this down and use it in your main answer as a value addition okay now let us see the reasons for the movement of the manufacturing sector from urban to rural areas the first reason is the factory floor space supply constraints let me explain whenever a factory decides to replace labor by machinery they need to expand the floor space of the factory but the issue here is when the factory is located in urban area it cannot expand easily as the urban areas are usually congested so this factor does not allow the factory to expand like it can do in the rural areas we can say that increased capital intensity of the production is one of the reasons for the factories to move from urban to rural areas here capital intensive refers to the production process that requires higher percentage of investment in fixed capitals like buildings and machines in capital intensive sector they invest more in capital assets to increase productivity and profit opposite to capital intensive is labor intensive if a sector is labor intensive they invest more in labor like training and upskilling so this is the first reason for the factories to move from urban to rural areas moving on to the second reason the second reason is production cost differentials see many firms experience substantial higher operating cost in cities when compared to rural areas usually cost of living is also much higher in cities than in rural areas so this is one of the reasons that is pushing factories from urban areas towards rural areas the third reason is the possibility of capital restructuring see large multi plant corporations will have a tendency for increasingly accumulating capital and centralizing their operation in order to do that these big corporation deliberately shift their production from cities to rural areas why are they doing so they are doing so to take the advantage of less skilled less unionized and less costly rural labor which is not present in cities so just to exploit this that is low cost labor the big corporations are moving from the urban area to rural area so these are the three reasons why manufacturing sector is moving from india's urban areas to rural areas see one of the main advantage of this trend is this trend will help in industrializing the rural areas of india see in india after the lpg reforms the contribution of agriculture to our economy has been declining but on the other hand agriculture continues to employ most number of indians in our country so what we have to do is we have to reduce the employment provided by agriculture and move them to the manufacturing sector and this trend of moving factories from urban areas to rural areas will provide additional job in the rural areas which will ease the transition of the labor from agriculture to manufacturing okay in addition to this it will also industrialize the rural areas this is one of the major advantage of the urban to rural manufacturing shift see this shift also has some challenges associated with it. let us see them one by one the first challenge is cost of capital we saw that factories move from urban areas to rural areas to take advantage of the low cost labor and lower rent and this advantage is compensated or negated by higher cost of capital because in rural areas borrowing is very difficult and to borrow they have to pay more interest so the cost the factories save by low cost labor and lower rent is compensated by the higher cost of capital this is the first challenge associated with the urban to rural manufacturing shift moving on to the second challenge the second challenge is related to the skill shortage in rural areas 
we know that the present day high technology global new economy needs highly skilled workers manufacturers who depend only on low wage workers simply cannot sustain their competitive edge for a longer period as their cost advantage might vanish over time so the low skilled labor or the shortage of skilled laborers in the rural areas is the second challenge associated with the urban to rural manufacturing shift so to conclude to actually realize the potential of rural areas a more educated and skilled rural workforce is required if such a thing is ensured then the factories can enjoy the comparative advantage of lower wages higher reliability and increased productivity this in turn will fasten the transition of our rural economy from agriculture to high paying manufacturing sector so that's all regarding this discussion this discussion is very relevant for your gs3 mains paper so see the points that we discussed very carefully here we discussed the reasons for urban to rural manufacturing shift the advantage of this shift and the challenges associated with the shift so make note of all the points we discussed so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about the wildlife protection amendment bill 2021 recently this amendment bill was passed by both lok sabha and rajya sabha so in this editorial discussion we will see some of the major changes made by the amendment and also we will see the significance of the amendment and the issues associated with the amendment this is the plan for this discussion before getting into the discussion i have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it the wildlife protection amendment bill 2021 was introduced in lok sabha by the minister of environment forest and climate change the bill amends the wildlife protection act 1972 We know that the act regulates the protection of wild animals, birds and plants and the 2021 amendment seeks to increase the species protected under the act. Also, this amendment seeks to implement the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora that is CITES. Here CITES is an international agreement signed between governments in 1973. and sites tries to ensure that international trade in wild animals and plants does not threaten the species okay now let us see the major changes made by the amendment firstly take sites under sites plants and animal specimens are classified into three categories which we call it as appendices and this is based on the threat to their extinction The convention requires countries to regulate the trade of all the listed specimens through permits then it also seeks to regulate the possession of live animal specimens so this amendment seeks to implement these provisions of sites okay this is the first major change made by the 2021 amendment secondly the amendment rationalizes the schedules see previously the 1972 act had six schedules that is one for specially protected plants four for specially protected animals and one for vermin species and here vermin refers to animals that carry disease and destroy food okay what the amendment does is it reduces the total number of schedules to 4 this is done by reducing the number of schedules for specially protected animals to 2 then it also removed the schedule for vermin species and instead of that it inserted a new schedule for the specimens listed in the appendices under sites this is the second major change thirdly the amendment implements the obligations under sites the amendment provides for the central government to designate different authorities for different purposes first is the management authority management authority is to grant export or import permits for trade of specimens second is the scientific authority it gives advices related to impacts on the survival of the species that are being traded okay every person engaged in trade of scheduled specimens must report the details of the transaction to the management authority the authority can use an identification mark for a specimen also no one can modify or remove the identification mark on the specimen additionally persons possessing live specimens of scheduled animals must obtain a registration certificate from the management authority so these are the two different authorities established by the recent amendment and this is in obligation to sites moving on to the next major change 
it is in regards to invasive alien species the amendment empowers the central government to regulate or prohibit the import trade possession and proliferation of invasive alien species here invasive alien species refers to plant or animal species which are not native to the home country and in our case it is india and the introduction of these kind of invasive species may adversely impact the wildlife and its habitat so the central government after the amendment may authorize an officer to seize and dispose of the invasive alien species okay now moving on to the next major change this is regarding the control of sanctuaries earlier that is according to the 1972 act the chief wildlife warden is entrusted with the control management and the maintenance of all the sanctuaries in a state and the chief wildlife warden is appointed by the state government what the amendment does is it specifies that the actions of the chief wildlife warden must be in accordance with the management plans of the sanctuary and these plans must be prepared as per the guidelines of the central government and it should be approved by the chief warden then for sanctuaries falling under special areas the management plan must be prepared after due consultation with the concerned gram sabha okay here special areas include scheduled areas or areas where scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers act 2006 is applicable okay these scheduled areas are economically backward areas with the predominantly tribal population notified under the fifth schedule of the constitution okay so basically earlier it is the state government that had major say in the control of sanctuaries now the central government is indirectly controlling the chief wildlife warden by making him stick to the management plan proposed for each sanctuary okay this is the fifth major change moving on the next major change is regarding the conservation resource see before the amendment it is the state government that can declare areas adjacent to national park and wildlife sanctuaries as conservation reserve but after the amendment the central government can also notify conservation reserves near national parks and sanctuaries the next major change is regarding the surrender of captive animals the amendment provides for a person to voluntarily surrender any captive animals or animal products to the chief wildlife warden here you have to note that no compensation will be paid to the person for surrendering such specimen and the surrendered specimen becomes the property of the state government the last major change is in regards to penalties the 1972 act also provided imprisonment and penalties for violation of the act what the amendment did is it increased the penalties for violations of the act so these are all the major changes made by the 2021 amendment to the wildlife protection act now let us see the significance of these amendments first is through the amendment our government is trying to merge the national law with the international law this will enable our country to curb illegal trade of wild species second major significance is that by increasing the penalties provided for the offenses committed under wildlife protection act the government is signaling that the government will not tolerate further crimes against wildlife the third major significance is that by making the amendment our government is signaling that community participation is necessary for the conservation of wildlife how it is doing so it is doing so by involving gram sabhas in making conservation plans in the scheduled areas so through this the government is signaling that it is community participation that is one of the major requirement for the conservation of wildlife in our country the last major significance of the amendment is regarding to invasive species while discussing we saw that the government can designate an officer who is specifically appointed to seize and dispose invasive alien species so these are all the four major significance of the 2021 amendment to the wildlife protection act the amendment is not without its fair share of issues now let us see some of the issues with the amendment first issue is regarding penalties we saw that the government has increased the penalties for violations under the wildlife protection act but the problem is there is no proper policing the bill does not mention how the penalties will be implemented and how the policing will be done to implement the penalties so there is a void in the recent amendment this is the first issue 
The second issue is regarding forest rights. See the 1972 act criminalized collective forest rights like fishing and we know that collective forest rights like fishing forms one of the important part of subsistence of tribal communities. But this recent amendment also did not make any changes regarding this. After this amendment also rights like fishing by scheduled tribes remains a criminal offense under wildlife protection act. So this is the second major issue. These are the two major issues associated with the recent amendment. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some of the major changes proposed by the 2021 amendment. Then we saw some of the significance and the issues associated with the amendment. I hope this discussion was useful. Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article here. This article talks about the sixth schedule of the constitution. On August 5th, 2019, the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir was bifurcated into union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. This led to the removal of special status that was earlier granted to the unified Jammu and Kashmir. After the removal of special status, several political groups in Ladakh have been demanding that land, employment and cultural identity of Ladakh should be protected under the sixth schedule of the constitution. To address this issue, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Home Affairs was constituted. Later, the committee tabled a report in the Rajesh Sabha. The report recommended that special status may be granted to the Union Territory of Ladakh by considering the developmental requirement of the tribal population. Responding to this report, the Home Ministry said that the main objective for inclusion of tribal population under 5th or the 6th schedule is to ensure their overall socio-economic development and the ministry also highlighted that the developmental process in Ladakh has already started and also sufficient funds are being provided to Ladakh to meet their developmental requirements. So overall the Home Ministry said that it is not necessary to provide special status to the Union Territory of Ladakh under 6th schedule. So this is about the news article. In this context let us learn about the 6th schedule of the Indian Constitution. First of all, the provisions relating to the 6th schedule are provided under Article 244, Class 2 and Article 275, Class 1 of the Indian Constitution. The 6th schedule consists of provisions relating to the administration of tribal areas in the states of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram, AM, TM. The 6th schedule provides for administration of certain tribal areas in these four states as autonomous districts and autonomous regions. So, this is the basic introduction about the 6th schedule. Now, moving on, we will see the powers of the governor under the 6th schedule. Under the provisions of the 6th schedule, the governor of the state is empowered to determine the area or areas as administrative units of the autonomous districts and autonomous regions. The governor has the power to create new autonomous district or region. The governor also has the power to alter the territorial jurisdiction or even alter the name of any autonomous districts or autonomous region. So these are the powers in regards to governor under the 6th schedule of the constitution. Now moving on let us see about the autonomous district councils and the regional councils. The 6th schedule has the provisions for the creation of autonomous district councils and regional councils in states which are placed under the 6th schedule. The councils are endowed with certain legislative, executive, judicial and financial powers. However, the administrative powers and functions of the district council and regional council differ from state to state. This is about the autonomous district council and regional council. Now let us see about the composition of the council. According to the 6th schedule, each autonomous district shall have a district council and the council shall consist of not more than 30 members. Among the 30 members, 4 are nominated by the governor, while the rest are elected on the basis of adult franchise. Note one point here, there is one exception, that is, Bodoland Territorial Council in Assam can have up to 46 members in the council. This is about the composition of the council. Now finally, let us see about the important powers of the councils. The 6th schedule confers certain executive, legislative and judicial powers to the district council. 
they have the autonomy to make laws for their land the councils also have the power to manage their forest that are other than the reserved forest even the councils have the power to appoint traditional chiefs and headmen for their land so this is about the powers of the district council see i have not covered every aspect of the sixth schedule due to the time limitation but i have given a basic introduction and basic points about the sixth schedule so in the future discussion if the news article again appears let us cover the sixth schedule in detail so with this let us conclude this discussion in this discussion we saw about the issue in ladakh and also some of the major provisions of the sixth schedule so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this news article here it speaks about district disability rehabilitation centers that is ddrc the parliamentary standing committee on social justice and empowerment has said that so far only 55 to 60 ddrcs have been made functional but the target was to establish 269 centers in designated districts so the committee advocated that the government should lay down a proper road map to establish district disability rehabilitation centers in every district of the country as targeted this is about the news article so in this discussion today let us learn about district disability rehabilitation centers that is ddrcs the ddrc is a initiative by the ministry of social justice and empowerment it aims to facilitate comprehensive services to the persons with disabilities who are residing in the rural areas the rehabilitation centers provide services like identification of persons with disabilities then awareness generation then early detection and also intervention this is the basic about ddrc now let us talk about the administration of ddrc the rehabilitation centers are run jointly by the district management team headed by the collector and a reputed ngo here the ngo is usually indian red cross society the ddrc is a joint venture of central and state government here the role of the central government is to establish initiate and implement the rehabilitation centers the central government also provides funding for manpower contingencies and they also provide required equipment and coordination now coming to the role of the state government the state government has to provide rent free well constructed buildings for the rehabilitation centers then the state government also provides support system to the centers like telephone facility furniture etc the state government also monitors and coordinates the activities of the rehabilitation centers through the district management team so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some important points about the district disability rehabilitation centers with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this news article This news article speaks about Sri Arbindu Ghosh. Yesterday, our Prime Minister released a commemorative coin and postage stamp to mark the ongoing 150th birthday anniversary celebrations of Sri Arbindu Ghosh. In his virtual address, our Prime Minister hailed Sri Arbindu's life and work. He said that the modern thoughts, higher consciousness, and uncompromising nationalism of Sri Arbindu. should inspire india's leadership role in the world in greater measure this is about the news article given here in this context let us learn about the contributions of sri arbindu ghosh in india's independence movement and we will also learn about some of the points related to alipur bomb case first let us see in brief about sri arbindu ghosh arbindu ghosh was born in 15th august 1872 in kolkata he was an indian philosopher poet and nationalist When Arbindu was 5 years old he was sent to a convent school at Darjeeling then after 2 years in 1879 Arbindu was sent to England along with his brothers for higher studies and he completed his schooling from St Paul's in London then in the year 1890 Arbindu got admission into the University of Cambridge to comply with the wishes of his father Arbindu also applied for ICS while at Cambridge and he passed the Indian civil service examination with great merit in 1890 however he failed in the horsemanship test and hence he was not allowed to enter the civil service of the Indian government then in 1893 arbindu ghosh returned to india this is the brief about sri arbindu ghosh now moving on let us see about the contributions of sri arbindu ghosh in india's independence movement after returning to india arbindu became the 
வைஸ் பிரின்சிபல் ஆஃப் ஸ்டேட் காலேஜ் இன் பரோடா தென் இன் நைன்டீன் நாட் சிக்ஸ் அரபிந்து ரிசைன் ஹிஸ் ஜாப் இன் த வேக் ஆஃப் பார்ட்டிஷன் ஆஃப் பெங்கால் அண்ட் ஹீ ஜாயின் அஸ் அ ப்ரொஃபஸர் இன் த பெங்கால் நேஷனல் காலேஜ் ஃப்ரம் தேர் ஹி பிகேம் இன்வால்வ் இன் த ரெவல்யூஷனரி மூமெண்ட் அகேன்ஸ்ட் த பிரிட்டிஷ் then from 1908 arbindu ghosh played a leading role in india's freedom struggle he was one of the pioneers of the political awakening in india arbindu functioned as the editor of english daily bande matram in that he openly advocated the boycott of british goods and british courts also he asked the people to prepare themselves for passive resistance against the british this is all about the contribution of arbindu ghosh in india's freedom struggle Now moving on let us see about the famous Alipur bomb case. In 1908 the British judge Kingsford had imposed severe sentences against Indian nationalists. This made anger amongst the Indian revolutionaries. Some revolutionaries including Kudiram Bose and Parfulla Chakki tried to kill the judge. They threw bomb at the judge Kingsford's horse carriage. And the bomb lost its target and instead landed in another carriage. and the bomb blast killed two british women in that case arbindu was also arrested on charges of plotting and overseeing the attack then he was jailed in alipur jail in the trial of alipur bomb case which lasted for over an year arbindu eventually was acquitted in 6th may 1909 the defense counsel of arbindu was chitrandan das that is c r das before he was acquitted he was placed in the jail During the jail term of Arbindu his path of life was radically modified he was influenced by spiritual experiences and realizations due to various spiritual experiences Arbindu devoted his life for service and liberation of the country so this is about the Alipur bomb case okay so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the contribution of Sri Arbindu Ghosh for India's freedom struggle and we also saw about the Alipur bomb case Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Have a look at this news article. The news article says that 13 tribal settlements from Pillur and Palamalai forest areas in Coimbatore districts were recently accorded community forest rights. It was accorded after the forest area that they dwell and collect minor forest produce for generations were mapped using GPS based land survey. It was a year long process and it was the first case in the state where gps based land survey was done to accord community forest rights to the forest dwellers okay this is the crux of the news article given here the community forest rights in india is provided under the forest rights act 2006 so in this discussion let us revise about this act the forest rights act 2006 recognizes the rights of the forest dwelling tribal communities and other traditional forest dwellers This is to ensure their right on forest resource because these communities were dependent on these resources for a variety of needs like livelihood habitation and other socio cultural needs This act recognizes the symbiotic relationship of the scheduled tribes with the forest so it reflected the scheduled tribes dependence on the forest as well as their traditional wisdom regarding conservation of the forest Now let us see the objectives of the act Firstly the act tries to undo the historical injustice that is committed on the forest dwelling communities the second objective is the act tries to ensure land tenure livelihood and food security to the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers the third major objective is the act tries to strengthen the conservation regime of the forest This is done by including the responsibilities and authority of forest right holders for sustainable use. Also, the conservation of biodiversity and maintenance of ecological balance is strengthened through this act. Now let us see the rights that are provided by this act. The act provided right to self-cultivation and habitation. These are usually regarded as individual rights. Then it provides community rights such as grazing, fishing and access to water bodies in forest. then it provides habitat rights for particularly vulnerable tribal groups not only this it ensures access to biodiversity and traditional seasonal resources then the act ensures the community right to intellectual property and traditional knowledge and it also recognizes the traditional customary rights it also provides the right to allocation of forest land for developmental purposes this is mainly done to fulfill the basic infrastructural needs of the community 
then it also protects the tribal population from eviction without rehabilitation and settlement then the act envisages the gram sabha and rights holders the responsibility of conservation and protection of biodiversity wildlife forest water resource and ecologically sensitive areas also it gives them responsibility to stop any destructive practices affecting these resources or cultural or natural heritage of the tribals so the gram sabha is also a highly empowered body under the act because it enables the tribal population to have a decisive say in the determination of the local policies and schemes impacting them so we can conclude that this act empowers the forest dwellers to access and use forest resources in their traditional ways also it envisages the forest dwellers and other communities dependent on forest the responsibility of protection conservation and management of forest then it protects forest dwellers from unlawful evictions and provides basic development facilities to the community of forest dwellers to access facilities of education health nutrition and infrastructure so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions we have five practice prelims questions let us see them one by one let us take up the first question three statements are given we have to find the incorrect statements here so let us take up the first statement wpi captures changes in the service prices this statement is wrong actually wpi that is wholesale price index measures change in prices of goods only okay moving on to the second statement cpa is released by rbi this statement is also incorrect because cpa that is consumer price index is released by the nso that is national statistical office moving on to the third statement clothing and footwear is a component of wpa this statement is also wrong actually clothing and footwear is a component under cpa since all the three statements are incorrect and they are asking for the incorrect statements here the correct answer here is option c 1 2 3 moving on to the second question two statements regarding secret sitting of the house is given we have to find the correct statements let us take up the first statement the term secret sitting is found nowhere in the constitution of india see actually this statement is incorrect because the term secret sitting is mentioned in the article 361 a this article is concerned with protection of publication of proceedings of parliament and state legislature according to this article no person shall be liable to any proceedings civil or criminal in any court this protection is applicable only if true report of proceeding of either house of parliament or either house of state legislature are published in a newspaper the article also says that if the publication is proved to have been made with malice that is with wrong intention then this protection will not be available to any person additionally it says that nothing in this clause shall apply to the publication of any report of the proceedings of secret sitting of either house of the parliament or either house of the legislature of the state so the term secret sitting is mentioned in article 361a but the definition and conditions are not given in the constitution it is given in the rules of procedure of the house so statement 1 in essence is incorrect moving on to the second statement disclosure of proceedings or decisions of a secret sitting by any person in any manner shall be treated as a gross breach of privilege of the house this statement is correct in addition to this you have to know that when the necessity for maintaining secrecy in secret sitting has ceased to exist and subject to the consent of the speaker the leader of the house or any member may move a motion that the proceeding of the house during the seeker sitting has no longer be treated as a secret on adoption of such a motion the secretary general of the house shall prepare a report of the proceeding of the seeker sitting and publish it in such a manner as the speaker may direct so after this motion only proceedings of the secret sitting will be published until then only speaker decides how to make a report of the proceeding of secret sitting and no other person shall keep a note or record of the proceedings or decisions of the secret sitting so statement 2 is correct so the correct answer here is option b 2 only moving on to the third question three statements regarding sri arabindu ghosh is given we have to find the correct statement let us take up the first statement arabindu ghosh edited the english newspaper bande matram 
this statement is correct this we saw in our discussion itself moving on to the second statement arabind ghosh was arrested in the infamous alipur bomb conspiracy case along with kudiram bos and parfula chakki this statement is also correct moving on to the third statement arabind ghosh opposed the spiritual experience actually this statement is incorrect because arabind ghosh got influenced by the spiritual experiences and realization and he did not oppose it since they are asking for the correct statement the correct answer here is option a one and two only moving on to the fourth question here two statements regarding sixth schedule is given we have to find the correct statements let us take up the first statement it consists of provisions related to the administration of tribal areas in the states and unit territories of assam meghalaya ladakh and andaman and nicobar this statement is incorrect the sixth schedule consists of provisions related to the administration of tribal areas in the states of assam meghalaya tripura and mizoram that is amtm so statement one is incorrect moving on to the second statement under the sixth schedule the president of india is empowered to create a new autonomous region or district this statement is also incorrect because in our discussion we saw that under the provision of sixth schedule it is the governor of the state who is empowered to create a new autonomous district or region and not the president since both the statements are incorrect the correct answer here is option d neither one nor two this is a quiz question for you interested aspirants can post the answer for this question in the comment section the main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here interested aspirants can write the answers and post it in the comment section if you like today's video you can like comment and share it with your friends For more updates regarding UPSC preparation subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel thank you